this malware contains an exploit that drops me to root shell directly. It is just a normal shell script, but you cannot see the contents. In this video, I will show you a Linux tool that can perform program obfuscation and encryption. This is Ben Cryptor from the Hacker's Choice. It packs, obfuscates, and encrypts ELF binaries and shell scripts. It is designed to be stealthy by generating different signatures for every run. This tool avoids touching the disk during the obfuscation process. And there are more features, so let's try this out. Installation is easy. You can clone the project and run the script from within, or you can download a binary release. Let's say we have a simple bash script like this. If we look at the file type, we can see here that it is set to text. Now, if we run Ben Cryptor, it will perform rounds of obfuscation and compression against the file. And if we check again the file type, it is now set to binary data. So if we cat the file, we can't see anything useful. This is a very effective way of hiding the contents of your program. If we inspect the readable strings, there are a few that stands out. First is it still puts a shebang on top since this is required in order for Linux to treat this as a bash script. We also see here some code related to Perl. This is part of the obfuscation process, which we will analyze in a bit. But other than that, the rest will be just a garbage data. Aside from obfuscating the contents, we can also encrypt the program so that only you can run it. To do that, we use same command as before, but this time we indicate the password as the last parameter. Now, when we run the resulting encrypted script, it will ask us first for the password. This is a level up from the previous version of the script. For example, it will be harder for defenders to uncover the contents of a malware. Because instead of just figuring out how the binary data is mapped to actual readable code, they first need to bypass the authentication. The obfuscation logic was designed to produce different signatures for every run. Let's say an attacker wants to distribute multiple malwares to different hosts. He can obfuscate each malware and the resulting files will have different checksum values. This makes it hard for defenders and antivirus engines to identify the malware. So they must try to identify it in another way, such as analyzing the network or disk activities. Another cool feature is to lock a program to a particular system. That means it will only run on the system where it was obfuscated. To do that, we pass the BC lock environment variable before obfuscation. The content of that variable is the alternative command to run whenever the script is run on a different machine. So when we transfer this to another host and run from there, it will not execute the original content of the script, but instead it will execute the alternative command we specified on the environment variable. Now let's analyze the obfuscation process. The script is designed to live off the land, which means it tries to use the available tools inside the machine. This prevents it from installing additional softwares and libraries, which can generate alerts if you try the obfuscation process within the victim. So it will check first if Perl is installed. If it can locate Perl, it will use various Perl commands wrapped inside these functions. This is also the reason why we see a small readable Perl code in the resulting obfuscated script a while ago. If Perl is not installed, then it will use another set of native Linux commands such as DDTR and printf. For the rest of the discussion, we will assume Perl is installed in the system. Let's look at the first function, which is bcxdd. This runs a Perl expression, so let's break it down. It reads data from standard input and store it inside the variable specified here and it only reads a specific amount of bytes. This is a good practice to prevent buffer overflow vulnerabilities. Once it reads the data, it will print whatever is stored inside that variable. If we look at the function name, this seems to mimic the functionality of Linux DD command. The next important thing to look at is the bcxtr function. This is using another Perl expression. It performs regular expression substitution on whatever pattern is specified here. These are denoted by $1 and $2, so that means it will be passed as a function parameter, which we can see later in other parts of the code. If it matches the pattern, it will delete it on all occurrence in the line. So this bcxtr function is to remove unwanted characters from a data. This also mimics the Linux tr command here, which deletes patterns specified via the dash d flag. The last function is just a Perl expression that will print the string specified as an argument. So, in summary, we have three Perl-related functions. First is to read a specified amount of bytes from input and print it. Second is to delete the character specified by the regular expression pattern. And the third one is just to print the input. Below those lines, we see here that it assigns default values for variables related to program machine locking and quiet output. Right after that, we see several functions here, which most likely the ones that performs the obfuscation. For now, let's skip them and proceed to the main part of the script. 
Here we see it perform some checks to ensure the required commands are present, such as OpenSSL, Perl, and gzip. We can also see that as requiring the kernel random generator device. This means the entire obfuscation process relies on this special file, which should be always available on most Linux distros. There might be cases where this is unavailable, for example, if you compile your own kernel and you omit this from the file system. In this line, we see that it auto-generates the password when it is not set by the user. This means, even though we don't specify the password in the command line parameters like what we did a while ago, it will still encrypt the program using its auto-generated password. The logic of auto-generating the password is done here. It uses the Perl wrapper we saw at the start of the script, which is the BCXDD. It sends random data using the kernel random generator, but it only takes 32 bytes from it. After that, it pipes it to base64 using one line format. It then pipes it again to the other Perl wrapper, which is the BCXTR. This time we see the patterns it tries to remove, which is any alphanumeric character at start of the line. Finally, it pipes it again to BCXDD to take only 16 bytes. Question is how strong is this random 16 character password? If we go to security.org, and type the password here, we see that it will take 6 million years to crack the password. This means if we generate our own custom password using that logic, it will be technically not feasible to brute force it. There is also a salt that introduced to make the password more resistant to offline cracking. It used the same Perl wrappers to generate a random salt value. There is a base64 encoded data here called the hook. This is the one that will decrypt and run the program. Later, we will explore more what is inside of this. In this line, the content of the program is compressed and converted into base64 format. This will be used on the later part of Bencryptor. The next important part is to obfuscate the hook. It uses this function, which is the one we skipped a while ago. The idea of this function is to insert non-printable characters on random locations of the original string. To better visualize that, I copied all functions to a separate bash script so we can source it and run each function individually. So for example, if we try to obfuscate the word hello, we will see mostly garbage. But if we inspect the hex dump of the output, we still see the original data, but this time they are separated by different non-printable characters. Going back to Bencryptor, we see here the main function that builds the resulting obfuscated program. It consists of three parts, which are the shebang, the hook, and the encrypted program. It will first put the shebang so that Linux will recognize it as a bash script. Then it performs several levels of obfuscation. First one is a 66-byte random data, then followed by another random data, but this time the size varies because it also uses the bash built-in variable called random to determine the resulting size. Next to that is it inserts the hook. During this process, it again performed an obfuscation, but this time it uses a different method. This function is similar to the previous obfuscating function, but this time, instead of inserting a non-printable character, it uses specific character sequences. To demonstrate, let's again source the function and run it against a simple string. The original string is visible, even without us having to use a hex dump utility. We also see that the pattern of the inserted characters is more predictable. Now let's do a quick analysis of the hook. That is in base64, so I decoded it and put it inside this file. The first thing it tries is to check whether the required Linux commands are present. Then it locates the password for decrypting the program. This can be either the custom password set by the user or the auto-generated password from Bencryptor. After getting the password, it will use it as a parameter to open SSL command to decrypt the program. Finally, after decrypting the code, it will be passed to eval function for execution. Now, you might ask the question, if our program is obfuscated, how would Bash Interpreter be able to execute that? To answer that, let's look at the resulting obfuscated program. At the top, we know that the shebang is required. That's why it is always included. After that, we see the familiar obfuscated data created by BCO bell function. Will Bash be able to execute in that form? Let's try out by obfuscating a simple command. Now, if we try to run it, we see the correct output, which means bash ignores the patterns inserted in between and proceed in executing the command. If you come to think of it, this obfuscation method can also be a technique for bypassing command injection filters. I never thought of this, but this is just some of the good things we learn along the way by just reading others' code. Going back to the obfuscated program, after the eval code, we now see the garbage data. This contains the hook and the encrypted program. We know that somewhere in the process, the hook also got obfuscated. But it is not encrypted, which means we can just remove the non-printable characters, which will give us the base64 encoded form. Then we can just decode it easily. After decoding, eval will run that code in order to decrypt our obfuscated program. And finally, the program execution continues normally. The obfuscation process we saw in this video involves encrypting the program 
decrypting it using a hook function, and performing different levels of obfuscation. This is just one way of doing it, and there are more things we will explore in future videos. I hope you learned something today. If you find my content valuable, please support me by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. See you on the next one.